Hi, dear guys. Hi. Welcome again to Bible study. Another Bible study. So, you know how we start out every Bible study. It's somebody to sing a prayer chorus for us and somebody to open in prayer for us. So, any volunteers? It's a lot of us in us, so. <laughs> volunteers, please. <laughs> a person. All right, just somebody to sing a scene. I'll buy her. All right, thank you. Whenever you guys ready. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone does my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. Dear God, we come before you tonight just to say thank you, dear God, for being here. God, I ask that as we go into this Bible study, that you open up our hearts and our minds, dear God, to listen to each other's opinions, dear God, but be respectful, but also to use our discernment, dear God, as we go through this process, dear God, as we cover what we're covering tonight. Whoever is leading, dear God, I ask that you touch this person, dear God, and just let them speak through them, dear God, to us, dear God, whatever it is that we need to hear, even if we don't think, dear God, that it's related to this verse, dear God, let one of us pull it out and make the connection, dear God, that needs to reach somebody in this Bible study tonight, dear God, as we do every week, dear God, I ask that you just be here with us, dear God, and lead us in this discussion tonight and help us to continue to glorify you, dear God, in this way, week after week. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Elena. So... As you guys know, we were in John chapter, no, I'm confused. John chapter three, and we're at part three now. I don't remember what verse we're at. Hold on. Anybody remember what? Oh yeah, we're at verse 22, right? In John chapter three, verse 22 onwards. So we're just gonna finish up John chapter three tonight. And it's Kiabi, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so guys, um, I'm going to read through and then once you guys feedback and then, you know, like we have a discussion. So I'm going to read from, can you guys hear me first of all or I need to talk louder? Am I breaking up or? Hear you per well, I'm hearing you perfectly. Okay, guys, we're oh. hearing you. Okay. So I'm going to read from verse 22 to 25, and then we move on from there. So, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem, because there was much water there, they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. Oh, sorry, I mean 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So does anybody want to go first to start the discussion? Any comments? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Take care, man. I'll go ahead first. Um, what really stood out to me while you were reading was for some strange reason, verse 24, where it says, for John was not yet cast into prison. Um, and you'd want to think that based on our conversation in either this chapter, it was, I think it was this chapter, or chapter one, sorry, um, where we were pointing out John the Baptist's mission, which was to, to make way or to make clear the way of the Lord. And you'd want to think that after baptizing Jesus and, you know, Jesus being here that, he would have said, all right, that's good enough. My work here is done. But we see very clearly here that even though he had baptized Jesus and Jesus was vibing and doing his thing, John the Baptist didn't take that as a cue to be any less um, intentional in continuing the work that he knew God had endowed him with. Um, and again, the reason why I highlight verse 24, because it kind of gives this vibe that John the Baptist was going to do whatever God needed him to do until God said, all right, that's enough. And it's time to, you know, put you to sleep until I come again. Like that was the full stop to the, the end of John the Baptist's mission story. Not, you know, he doesn't feel like anymore or he already did what he felt like he needed to do. But he understood that his mission was for his entire life. And it was only when he was cast in prison and ultimately put to death. I love that question, Julia, and I'll present I was going to answer that, but I'd, I'd like to present that to, to, to everyone. How do we know when our work is done? Or, and I'll, I'll add a, a part two to that question. Is our work ever done? Um, yes, that's what Danielle was saying. Um, I don't remember if... Uh, Okay, so what came to my mind while Brandon was talking about um, John the Baptist, like, was when Paul was saying that, I think it's Hebrews, I'm not sure, but I'm not finding the scripture right now. So he was saying that we should run our race with endurance until the end, right? And uh, the even though, like, Jesus was there and John baptized him and anything, like, John still was, you know, baptizing and, you know, oh, oh, I don't want to go ahead, but, you know, like he was um, directing his followers to Jesus and all that kind of stuff. So that's what really stood out to me about um, verse 24 while Brandon was talking and the fact that we should run our race with endurance until the end, like until we have died, then, oh, okay. But yeah. You can anybody else want to comment? Gabby, I just see it as we will be taxed with different missions throughout our life time. So maybe during this season in our life. God has placed it on our hearts to start a Bible study or start a food drive or whatever the case may be. But a year from now, our mission will change. But I don't think that God is going to stop using us until we die. So I agree with what you guys have been saying. Um, you can go ahead, Daniel. Oh, sorry. Oh, um, like I agree with you guys. I think, though, I would say instead that what can change is the means of achieving it. The mission is one thing, too. But the mission pretty much stays the same. It doesn't change, you know. We want to spread the good news. We want to bring people closer to Christ, things like that. The point is to bring glory to God at the end of the day. So I think like over time, it can change how we do. But at the end of the day, I think we should be. I feel like that can be misconstrued, what I just said about that should be achieving. And I don't mean should be achieving through 
our own flesh. I mean, as long as you're alive, as a Christian, everything you do should be bringing glory to God, you know? So the way we do it might change, but the goal and the mission, that just stays the same. Yeah, agreed. Um, and I just find it also interesting, again, just based on the simple words in verse 24, a very apparent truth that doing the work of the Lord will bring opposition. You know, this was just a, a, a good humble you, John the Baptist, just trying to do the Lord's work. And then verse 24 kind of gives us like the preview of what the end of his story would be. This was a good guy. This was just a guy doing his thing for the Lord. And yet he faced opposition in accomplishing that mission. Um, and so I think it's a very important takeaway that us facing difficulties on the way of trying to do what God wants us to do. A closed door doesn't always mean, all right, I shouldn't do this. Because the enemy very much wants to get in the way of us accomplishing our mission. But one thing that is absolutely certain is that the power of good is far greater than the powers of the enemy. And so even though sometimes the enemy would seek to get in the way of us doing what God has called us to, like John the Baptist, we have to be resolute in our pursuit of righteousness, to be resolute in our decision to, to complete the mission that God has tasked us with. And... I think saying that in a vacuum isn't very helpful. I think it's important for us to be very practical in in understanding that. And I think sometimes when we talk about the idea of, of mission, we think about it in a, a very grand and big way of like, you know, going off to foreign countries and, you know, doing missionary work and, and those those big stuff that we hear about. And mind you, God may call some of us to do those things, but I don't think we should overlook some of the the, the spaces God has given us now to be missionaries for him. God has surrounded us with friends that don't know him. God has surrounded us, us with family members that don't know him. And those could be our mission fields. And I think it's incumbent on us to just submit to God and ask God, God, I really don't know how this mission thing working. I'm no John the Baptist, but I just need you to help me be willing to be used by you to be the missionary in the mission fields that you're giving me to to, to witness to. Thank you, Brandon. I agree. And I have a comment for that because I remember like sometimes we overlook because we're, I don't know how to explain it, but sometimes we like overlook our family members and we don't know, or it's not like in at the forefront of our minds that, Hey, we have we there's a reason why we were placed in this family of origin and sometimes god requires of us to share his word with our family members and like a lot of the times well in the past for me it's like god put on my heart boy <laughs> you know have bible study with your family and i'm just like you could never be serious it's not me you're talking to. Like, I would say that I'm like, God, you know how difficult this can be. And it's like, I, it's like, I don't know. I never saw them as needing that kind of thing. I'm like, oh, no, man, they, they must be fine. And, you know, but it's like, like realizing that sometimes you're, ministry or your mission or whatever the word you guys want to use can be so close to home like right in front of you and you not seeing it because you're so focused on something else so yes that's and i also think that it's good that you know sometimes we ought to go back to god and say you know what god i don't know what i'm doing but just show me the way and it, it will be the simplest of things and you're just like oh oh wow okay so yeah does anybody have any more comments on this or the other verses? How do you identify your mission? 
I think like a lot of people, especially young Christians as well, right? It's like you sometimes you don't know like you think it's your mission, but it's not your mission. So how do you properly identify that this is actually your mission? Can you repeat that please? Before Daniel answers. How do you identify the mission that God has given you? Like like cause like you know, we all know that we're supposed to spread the gospel, right? So then you may think, okay, like I should make TikTok videos, I should start a local Bible study, I should go on the street and hold up a sign and like speak on a microphone. So like, you know, the different ways you could do it, and technically you are doing the grand mission, but maybe the way that you're doing it is not the way you're called to do it. So how do you, what would you say to someone who's struggling to identify the delivery, like what their mission is? specifically like the way they should go about it um you pray about it really and truly that's that's simply it um because even though two two people can have the same talent but for one person that talent that they have the same talent it's just not their ministry so you have to like actually pray about it and ask God to show you what your ministry is really and truly. For some people, they could, I, like I have a whole lot to say about it because I've been there. For some people, they're really good at evangelizing because they have the charisma. They have the stamina that it requires, like street evangelism. They have the stamina. They have the courage to really go out there. At least they act like they have the courage to go out there. You know, they may actually go out there and be nervous. But you really just have to pray about it and, and kind of like figure out exactly how. And I think too that it can also be something I think that to an extent, it works with the spiritual gifts that we have. So someone who has the gift of prophecy, you know, they can work in a deliverance ministry. That can be their thing. And someone who has discernment could also be in like deliverance ministry and stuff. But someone who has like the gift of helps may do very well, you know, like, um, you know, like charity events and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so you really just have to pray about it. Like, there's no, there's nothing else that we can, there's nothing else for you that is like, oh, you will know if X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z. If you don't know what your gift is, then you can pray about that too, to know what the gift is. And that can give you some direction or some direction into where you should be. But really, you have to pray about it. I think one of the first things, though, is that you have to accept when something is not your gift. Okay, some of us don't want to do that. We don't accept, especially in like traditional Jamaican church circles, where it's like certain things are more lauded than others. You know, so it's like if 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 you can do that, you're quote unquote better than the person who does this because this in some way within the circle is more important than that when that's not true but pray about it you know um and then whatever you feel led to do give it a shot really and truly and and don't really like overthink it and worry about it like oh i don't know what my thing is and stuff and it's horrible like no You'll figure out over time, and for some people, it's just not their time to start. And I'm sorry, I'm going on. But there's this lady that she experienced, like, real trauma from her ex-husband. He has a lot of outside children within their marriage, and then that became her ministry. You know, so she probably wouldn't have, she wouldn't have gotten that as her ministry, earlier or her ministry wouldn't have started earlier and not until this specific event happened to her you know and she wrote a whole book and she's helping a lot of people now thank you 
Um, something I don't mean to, you know, stray, but something that Daniel was saying, I what came to my mind to say was that when it is that you're praying for this revelation, expect a response because that's faith and also something else that came to my mind to say i don't remember but yeah just keep that for now so when it is that you start to pray and oh yes ooh, the famous word obedience it's gonna start with some simple tasks like obedience and that kind of stuff so yeah if I remember later on, and I'll see. Does anybody have any other comments before I point out which other scripture, you know? Brando. Yeah, I have a question. Um, oh, sorry. Directed towards Elena. What was your journey like discovering your mission and your mission field? Mm. I mean, just like Daniel said, like, I was just like, I believe my mission is to, is to evangelize, like, through speaking. Like, I think that's my gift. Like, I can sing on them something there, and I sing at church. But, like, I think my mission is, like, specifically young women and, like, evangelizing to young women, which is why, like, I have a group and, like, I do, like, ministry through that. Um, and I think my journey to that came from just my experiences living here because like I kind of feel like I went through everything like I came here I had a Christian in high school I guess but not really then I came here and then like I went through certain trials I won't share here because it's going on YouTube <laughs> but like I've been through certain things um that has like informed me and molded me and that led me to Christ that like I can like share to young women like here that are experiencing the exact same things and then like, I just kept praying to God and like literally when I was praying to God about like, oh, like God, I really want community. Like, I kept asking for Christian friends, but then it wasn't friends I needed. I needed to form a community. And then literally after I prayed that, I just like the same week, like this community started growing. Literally like a hundred girls just like slid into this group chat I made and just wanted community. So then I was like, okay, I think it's my confirmation that's what I'm supposed to do. And like, it's growing, right? So I think that that was my journey. Like as Daniel said to prayer about, I kind of felt, feel the question. So it's like out there. <laughs> but um, that was like my journey and it could change, right? Like maybe in like 10 years, they check me and that's not what I'm supposed to be doing anymore. As Daniel also said, but I think right now in this season where I'm at, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just like to throw it into that sometimes it comes to you too. Like it's happened to me before, like what Alana said, like I had specific experiences, very, like very specific experiences that felt like they were unique to me. And then people who were having the exact same experience, they just found me and started telling me um, what it is. And, it, it, you know, having gone through it myself, I was able to give them the advice and the help that they needed. And then through a quite life-changing experience that I had, like in seeking to understand it more, like I wanted to understand what happened to me more and I looked more into it. And then after that, I actually just keep, it's like I'm just at a place and the people who need the help are just at the same place and God literally just says to me, that person, go there. They need your help. This is what going this is what's going on. And then I just move from that. So there's also that too. Thank you. Um I'm not seeing anything, so is anybody hands raised or have any further comments? Okay, yeah, but not a comment, but I just want to read a verse that 
I think, complements very beautifully what Elena and Daniel said. So it's found in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, both of them just describe this idea of going through experiences that help them to discover God. And on that basis, they were able to reach out to a mission field that faced similar stuff. And I think that's the beauty of, of, of what God does. He uses our experiences not just for our good, but as like the basis to be good to somebody else. Very true. Totally agree. Let me check the chat to see if there are any other comments. Okay. No, I don't see any. But a while ago, I was just, you know, reading over verse 26. We had to stop at 26. We went from 20 to 26, right? So verse 26 says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all coming to him. And uh, what the Bible that I use in like it, um, like I went back to John, John chapter 1, verse 19 to 34, and it reads, now, um, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests to him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed, not the Messiah. Asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He said, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had not sent, who had, sorry, now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of Jordan, where John was baptizing. And he goes down to testify about Jesus in that chapter. And that's what came back to my mind while I was reading this. And... I was like questioning in my mind, like, why is it, if it is that John testified about the Messiah, like, why is it that they keep on, and and his testimony, I think, is in keeping with what they read in the Torah. Is it the Torah? Isaiah, I think it's in the Torah, but in their book, that's what they had relied on. But yet still, and they mentioned also that John was testifying about Jesus. So why would they come back to John and tell John? If John has already verbalized that he's making a way for Messiah and the Messiah is coming. And he quoted Isaiah, which I guess they read. Like, why would they come back to John and say, oh, to whom you have been testifying, behold, and all are coming to him as if, you know, Jesus is threatening John's ministry. So, yeah, that's what came to my mind. Do you want to comment on that? When I think about it, it reminds me of, I think it's when we were earlier on in John chapter 3. Um, I'll just say this one. Um, 
there's like this certain mold, this certain perception of what Jesus ought to have looked like. And then he came, he didn't fit that mold at all. So it is still like, they still haven't come to terms with it. And then there's there's something else, but let me gather my thoughts on that one but i think that's that's one of that's one thing anyone else until um i know speak second i'm not seeing you if you're raising your hand by the way so Okay, I think we can move on to the next verses. Oh, okay. So I'll be reading from 27 to, let me see, 31. Yes, so in verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from from heaven you yourselves bear me witness that i said i am not the christ but i have been sent before him he who is the bride is the bride he who has the bride is the bridegroom but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice therefore this joy is therefore this joy of mind is fulfilled he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Any comments? Yes, Gabby. So, um, doing what you just read, I just like seeing how humble John is in this part. Like, even when the people, they were saying, like, you know, um, see, there's this other guy who is, you know, baptizing people, kind of taking away your shine or however you'd want to interpret it. But it's the way that you can see that John is genuinely just doing this for God. He's not doing it for validation or not doing it to be recognized or anything, but he's doing this like purely from his heart, purely for God, purely for, you know, just to, just wanting to lead people to God, you know? So yeah, I really like that. So, sorry guys, I thought my mic was unmuted and I was talking. And um, what stuck out to me was when John started to talk about the bride and the bridegroom, right? Because we know that, I don't remember which scripture, but eventually I'll start to remember, but in scripture where it's mentioned that, you know, the church is the bride of Christ. And if it is like, let me see if I can find the exact line where John was saying it. That he was there saying, who has the bride is the bridegroom. Meaning, those who are, um, they're leaving John's ministry per se. This is how I see it. You can correct me if I'm wrong. They're leaving John's ministry to go to Jesus, right? And it's like, okay, Jesus is here on earth now. He's going to 
um, fulfill his duty, you know, to reconcile man unto God. He's going to die on the Christ and cross and be raised from the dead. And also, spiritually, you know, we'll be um, the bride and bridegroom Christ. But also here on earth, it's like it happened here on earth like in the physical as well that's what stuck out to me and he was and he said but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly and i think the way i, ha I think john was speaking about himself but the friend of the bridegroom so it's not uh as rav was saying that you know john was very humble it's not a oh my gosh people leaving my ministry and um you know panic no he's saying that okay christ has come to you know take the church like him come here he's lord like i am not even worthy to unstrap his sandals like john was in awe of the lord like he understood who christ was and i think a lot of the times people forget whether you're a pastor or you whatever your mission or ministry is like we tend to forget that we're doing this to the glory of god it's not as unto man like in the end we want the the aim is for god to be glorified so regardless of what takes place as long as god is being glorified so even that just stuck out to me so if anybody else wants to add anything um not on that i'm going back to the question that i said i would come back to um, okay, no all right so what first came to mind was the whole thing with um nicodemus when nicodemus was like um earlier on in the chapter and in verse 12 where jesus said if i have told you earthly things and you do not believe how will you believe if i tell you heavenly things right which was jesus asserting his well and then it goes on to say no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven that is the son of man who is in heaven so jesus here was like asserting his authority to speak on the matter and nicodemus didn't answer no when we examine Nicodemus did not understand. Then when we come down here, um, so verse 25, it says, Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came down to John, they, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Now, the argument, the dispute about the purification, there's no clear thing as to say exactly what they were arguing about. But what I have now learned is that, especially in that time, baptism for the Jews was a really controversial matter in terms of how it can be done and who can do it. And it's also in the Old Testament where, you know, the people were, the Israelites were encouraged and told to purify themselves and they could only go purify themselves with a priest, right? So for he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing and all are coming to him. Now to them, John baptizing that man, Jesus meant that jesus needed purification but john himself said that is not so so the way they're looking at it is that jesus is unclean and jesus does not have the authority to be baptizing anyone at all because as i said it's a very um it's a very it was a very sensitive topic at the time and then when we look at verse 28 now 29 where it says you yourselves bear me witness that i said i am not the christ but i have been sent before him he who has the bride is the bridegroom but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice therefore the joy of man is fulfilled 
he must increase but I must decrease no another thing is that John was is considered to be like the one who came before Christ basically so in their eyes in their legalistic eyes um John is suitable for the position of being a Baptist but Jesus isn't so to them John is I don't want to say is the Messiah but probably as good as they were going to get to a Messiah based on the, the thinking that they had about what the Messiah should be like even though John kept saying it is that they just couldn't come to terms with it so I think that's what was happening at the time and there was something else that I found and I didn't see if I can find it back um yeah that's it um, I have an next question right okay so it's like I'm reading through it and I'm like asking God in my head like why is it that I know that there's a scripture talking about sometimes like the word not being clear, but I'm still going to ask the question. Why is it that I think, well, John is like speaking in, is it proverbial language, but it's not like direct or maybe like I'm wondering if the if that is how they spoke to each other back then, like a lot of imply, like why didn't John say, I am not the Christ, he is the Christ. You get me? Instead of saying, um okay, hold on, let me go back. Like he said, there was a dispute. No, no, no. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that that oh that answered my question. But I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy is this joy of mine is fulfilled. Oh wow, I didn't see that. John is literally telling them that he is rejoicing because in verse 29 he said but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly and then he says therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled oh oh wow okay never mind i got my answer but does anybody else want to go or comment any further I have a comment on verse 30. I thought somebody was going to, to make a comment and I'm about it, but nobody did. Um, but I think verse 30 is a prescription for everything in life. That this has to be true for every single facet of life. That he must increase and we must decrease. And I think sometimes we like to compartmentalize our life. Like we have our spiritual space, but we have our academic space and our social space and our everything else space. Nah the relationship with Jesus has to permeate every aspect of our life. And because it has to permeate every aspect of our life, then this sentiment has to be true. I have to put God first in everything. Um, and I say it's a prescription for everything in life because uh, uh, um, a theme that I, I always love speaking on is the idea of victory over sin. And this is a sentiment that has to be true for victory over sin that he must increase and us, our flesh, our lust, have to decrease. And I think a verse of scripture that helps me understand that is Galatians 2 verse 20, which says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, the Christian life has to be defined by verse 30 of John chapter 3. Jesus continually being elevated and magnified in our lives while we, flesh and sin, is on a downward curve or a downward trend until flesh and sin are just completely overshadowed and overwhelmed 
by the grace of Jesus Christ and all he is in us. Um, I had highlighted that verse, but I saw it as John realizing that, you know, his time is near to leave. Because based on what Daniel said, if it is that they did not, see Jesus as qualified to baptize, then they would have, not saying that, you know, eventually the followers, but the fact that John, okay, I, I don't know if I'm preaching, but it's what came to my mind. The fact that John died, it's like, all of John's disciples, they went to follow Christ after, if I remember correctly. But that's what I was thinking about, like the fact that John said he must, you know, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. Like that's what came to my mind. Like John was like, yeah, man, it's time. So yeah, does anybody else have any other comments? You know, I think it's kind of like it's uh, this feels like a full circle moment now because we were just talking about oh um I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um him oh we were just talking about when does your mission end? And then up here it says um John had gone for John had not yet been thrown into prison. I mean he wasn't dead, but prison would I think would limit his ability but then it's like John knows he's going to die and then after that there's nothing but John also knows that Jesus will die be resurrected and then live forever so that's also how I look at he must I must decrease and he must increase too and then it reminds me of up in verse 14 that and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that who, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life I think that's also like to, to me it reminds it kind of brings a bell about increasing to me Thank you. Yes, that one was point. <laughs> Guys, the matter comes with this one. And also, like, just looking at this, I don't know if this can make sense, but I probably is a bit far off. But just like how now they were saying, you know, um, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Like, even though John knew, you know, Jesus was here and... um he was here baptizing people as well that didn't stop john from doing his mission as well like saying that our mission doesn't end until we die because even when jesus was here doing it john was like okay jesus come now you know like he can take over or whatever he was still doing his mission and doing what he was supposed to do if you get what i'm saying i don't know if you get what i'm saying but yeah i kind of saw that too yeah, that's true. I get that. And I agree with you. Okay, thank you guys. So, did I stop at verse 31 or? I don't remember which. Yeah, you, you stop at 31. Okay, thank you. So, verse 31 to. Can we finish this? Okay. To he who comes above all is above all. 
He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Oh, wow. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For him, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Does anybody want to go before I do? Okay, so what stuck out to me was the fact that Like what I was reading, I was just like, he who comes from above is above all. And uh, he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. And just the, the difference in Jesus, like we know that Jesus was going to die and be raised from the dead, right? And the fact that we are going to die until we are, until we are um, resurrected with Christ, right? And just that alone, like, and then he says down here, he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. And the fact that the people who were coming to John, they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, like who was who came to save us. So I don't know, that just put them perspective on the scripture for me. But yeah, that's, that's my comments for now. Anybody else wants to go? If you're raising your hand, I'm not seeing the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have a comment to make. Well, two comments. Uh, the first comment, I don't know if somebody had made because I had stepped away for a second. Did anybody make a comment about um, referencing Joshua and the captain of the Lord host or any of that? No. Okay. okay, cool. So I just wanted to bring our minds back to the conversation that we had when we were discussing the book of Joshua. And it's in John, Joshua chapter 5. Um, well, prior to Joshua chapter 5, around maybe verses 2 to 4 that were introduced to the idea of, you know, the children of Israel crossing the Jordan the same Jordan that we're talking about here. And then when getting on the other side of the Jordan, Joshua meets the captain of the Lord's host. He who, you know, in his presence called him to take off his shoes because he was standing on holy ground. Um, and the conclusion of our conversation on that matter was that this captain of the Lord's host, who was clearly divine, um, was a pre-incarnation Jesus, was the same guy we're talking about here. Um, is pre-incarnation the right word? The pre... Huh. Gabby, you got to fix pre incarnate Okay, great. Love that. Yeah. Was, you know, the same guy that we're talking about here. And I just find it so full circle that the same captain of the Lord's host who brought the children of Israel across the Jordan River brought the the... The, the big shots that these guys, the guys of today in, in, in John chapter 3 would have looked up to and would have all these great stories of that Jesus was present at that time and was there for them. And now he's trying to reintroduce himself to them again as that same guy. But it's, it's so crazy how the perspectives on this 
same said guy differ from them. You know, the, 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 the adoration to which the children of Israel would have given this guy, the reverence that Joshua showed the captain of the Lord's host. And yet here, you know, there almost seems to be a, a, a questioning of those who are paving the way of Jesus and then Jesus himself. And it's just like, you know, a moment to just kind of pause and be like, wow, that's, that's crazy. But I, I like the comment that John, completely unrelated point, the comment made in, in verse 35, where it says, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. And outside of me understanding this as the truth that is mentioned in verse 34, um, referencing the words of God, I want to personalize it and broaden it for as a bit. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hands. All things includes you. All things includes me. And I think when we personalize it like that and almost imagine ourselves as being in the hands of our loving savior, it it means something to me. But then when I also understand it as, you know, this being my loving savior, but then it's also being the captain of the Lord's host in Joshua chapter five, it gives me a sense of security that even as I think about it in my mind right now, it's almost hard to process it. But on one hand, I'm in the hands of a loving friend, but then I'm also in the hands of the captain of the Lord's host. So not only am I comforted, but I'm protected, I'm secured, I'm I'm all of these adjectives that, you know, my brain is moving too fast to even put into words. But it it it, it, it is a comforting thought to know that I mean I've been committed into the hands of the Son of God. You know? Yeah. Yes. And something that stuck out to me a while ago was the fact that verse 35, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the son has everlasting life and he who does not believe in the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. And I remember the scripture where John 14 verse and it says when Jesus was saying that I am the way the true life no one comes to the father except through me and then I think there's a there's a verse in Revelation about Jesus um if it's himself the son humbling himself before God and he's giving back the keys to God so that's what just stuck out to me a while ago so it's like I don't know it just stuck out to me I don't know what I'm supposed to get from it I guess they turn out to doubt what but that just jumped out to me a while ago but yeah does anybody else have anything to comment uh yeah can't wait. I'll, I'll try to keep this point concise um but verse 36 just highlights for me the the power of choice that god gives us he puts in our hands um, and again, it reminds me of the book of, of Joshua, closer to the end, where Joshua is like, you know, I said before you, life and death, um, choose you this day who you will serve. And it's like in verse 36, and one God, God, on one hand, God is saying, here is everlasting life. I want to give this to you, choose this. But because I created you as an agent of free will, there's another option that you can choose. I don't want you to choose that option but it's there if you'd like it. And that one isn't the one that I want you to choose. That one is eternal death. And it's like God giving us all the indications that, hey, this is a better choice. I want you to choose this. 
And all I ask you to do is believe in me. And yet, despite that, and as was the case with, you know, the, the, the same thing in Joshua, where Joshua was like, choose you this day who you will serve. And then Israel was just like, okay, sure. But then went up and served other gods anyway. It's like, how stupid can we be to see two options and one being so much better than the other? but then still allowing the enemy to influence us to choose otherwise. And I read something this week that reminded me of a very important fact that the enemy does not choose for us. While he may tempt, while he may woo, he can't choose. Ultimately, the choice is ours. And with such a contrast in choices, it's like, if we choose anything but eternal life through believing in God, it will be nobody's fault but our own. Because it's like, God gives us everything to be like, yo, go that way. He gives us the strength to believe. He shows us how to believe. He gives us grace when we don't believe. And then, yeah, sometimes we still pack up and say, I'm going to choose the the broad way. I'm going to choose that side. Um. But I pray that God continues to hold us fast and to continue to empower us to, to, to choose the better option everlasting life. Yes, and um, this is not the scripture that I was talking about, but back on Brandon's point of our choice and you know, God, well, Jesus being the key to everlasting life, was in Revelation 1 verse 18, where Jesus is saying, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. And that's therefore reinforcing, like when John said, to this, is a link, where he said, he who comes from above is above all he who is of the earth is earthly but speaks of the earth and it's like i don't think our brains can really understand what above all is like above everything that you could think like jesus was above that he, like death like sometimes i sit down and i'm just like wow jesus is like above death like you know something that seems so final in my mind like when i go to a funeral i just see the body there and i'm just like this is crazy like this feels like this is the end but he says i am the living one i was dead and now look i am alive forever and ever and i'm just like wow that's crazy but yeah that's what came to my mind is there anybody else that wants to come in? Rav, Alina, Yared. I don't know who else is here. Um, no, I think I think it's well covered. I was just like reflecting on what Brandon was saying that you know, the devil don't choose for us, and we need to, as he said, it, um, when he linked, what was it, Galatians two verse twenty, that. You know, like your flesh was crucified with Christ, right? But now Christ lives in you. It's like we have Christ living in us, but we still, we don't flee from sin. And, you know, we make the wrong decisions, but it's, but it's literally it's right there for us. So I was just like taking, I was just digesting that point still. So I haven't said anything, but I'm following the conversation. Thank you. Anybody else? before I hand back over to Rav. I wanted to talk about, if we could rally back, sorry, um, to, because I have to step away for a second, so maybe I missed this part, but verse, uh, what did I say on about? He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. So like when I like, read that verse i was even thinking about 
even now it's like getting people to believe can be such a challenge these days like even when they see things when they hear your testimony it's like what what do you what do you guys do when you're sharing the gospel and do you just like stay on people like because like the way people just push back you know like especially right now in the season it's crazy and that's what I was thinking about right now too that people could see hear hear your testimony everything and you you can get them to believe especially if it's like your family and your friends it's just like narrow it down the scope it down to not like random people that you don't really know personally but like with your friends and family if you've experienced trying to share the gospel with your friends and family and they don't receive it they're not trying to accept um eternal life what what have you been doing as a christian um in response to that like if you've been trying because i know sometimes we have a prayer like people like put that in like oh they want their family to come to christ but what have you what have we been doing as a group in our personal lives if we've experienced that um alana or alina um i'm glad you brought that up because like that's that's i don't know how to say it. like in my space when you're just talking about you know like sharing your testimony with your family i've experienced where it's like you share the testimony and you're like no man book up a coincidence or you know you share it out there and but for me, it's real because, like, say for instance, well, hmm, this week has been a lot of testimonies, right? So let me give you a prime example. I, I work and I go to school. So a part of going to school and working, you know, I mean, agreement with God, like, I would want to pay for my school fees, guys. <laughs> month of March just get paid I kid you not after paying school fee you know other financial responsibilities not wasting the money you know and the tithing and offering guys $700 leave back in my bank account so I had to go I'm say wait here well God are you want me this you know and i had to get out the bible and i say all right matthew 6 33 you said that this where is it verbatim right and he said therefore do not worry saying what shall we eat what shall we drink or what shall we wear after all these things the gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So I was like, God, you really say what by faith and not by sight because I'm only seeing $700 in my bank account for the entire month of my, 700 Jamaican dollars, by the way, it's not you. So guys, I was like, well, and you're setting number you're not a man that you should lie so let's see if this is real it and i wanted to go to a church gathering so i said well god i'm only gonna put a hundred dollars in my bag right and i am going to ask somebody to bring me home because if you're telling people to tell me that you love me right and uh, you're helping me in the word and all that's coming up is you know the lord loves me and all of these things surely surely if you love me you won't let me walk in the night by myself so i was just like okay you know what and you know the lord came through and other things so it's like i've been making a record of the testimonies and i have been doing that previously as well but going back to the point that alana alena i don't know how to pronounce, sorry alena alana was saying was that sometimes we share our testimony with people or family members and it's like they don't even give it any 
thought or you know like ponderings and say wow god is free he sees he is like like i can start to, you know what let me try and start to believe in jesus and himself there but yeah that's what came to my mind so yeah anybody else want to go yeah i actually have a story um so it was in sixth form i had recently made a new friend um and it was three of us like after school sometimes we used to go down to the beach and we'd have like um worship together and then we'd go in to the water for a swim and so it was like good days you know yeah um and i remember one time when we were going down there for worship you know that particular friend you know for a while i had been praying about it because you know there was some hesitancy on his part to accept some Bible truths. And I was just like, God, yo, I know you called me to plant a seed and I want my friend so desperately to ac accept your truth, you know, help that to be the case. And, you know, week after week we'd go and I'd hope for something, I'd pray and hope. And, you know, things looked like they were tending towards that direction. But then we went back to school the next week and then it was just like, the way that he was speaking about things that were indicators that he was, you know, getting close to accepting, you know, the Bible truth. It was, it was like, there were other friends in his life now that were influencing him. Otherwise, I know he was changing the way that he was thinking. And I was like, Jesus have mercy. We're so close, Lord. Like, what'd you do? Um, and I remember um, being encouraged by another one of my friends around the same time that God simply calls us to plant a seed and, you know, it's not on us to get worried or flustered or or mad over how fast the seed is growing or if it's growing or any of that. God just calls us to plant the seed and allow the Holy Spirit to do everything else. So God was teaching me that in that season. And I remember later on that week, me and my other friend, because there were three of us, me and my other friend went out to the beach and were praying about it and praying for this friend that he would accept it. And, you know, we were just going through the Bible looking for verses that if this conversation were ever to happen, you know, how would we have this conversation? We're looking and we're just vibing and, you know, enjoying going through the Bible together. Not really expecting that at any time the other friend would be like, yo, um, let's talk about this or that. Because in our minds, we were just like, you know, God, we're convinced that you will do this in your own time and whatever. And I remember it was a week after that, that we went down to the beach again. And now it was that same friend who we were praying for who now came to us and was asking us the questions and was, you know, prompting the same conversation and was intrigued. But at the same time, my other friend and I were prepared to have this conversation because we would have prayerfully presented it to God. And I was like, yo, God, here was me getting stressed and worried about this thing. And you were here already working behind the scenes and getting my friend intrigued and interested in knowing more about you and knowing more about your work. And so, you know, especially when it's people that we love and care about, sometimes it's it's easy to get worried when we're just like looking around the place and being like, yo, you know, the signs all foretell that the moment is nearing. Jesus is going to come back soon. And my family and friends out here not moving like them. They're trying to, you know, hear the words well done. Sometimes it's easy to see that and get concerned and overwhelmed. But one thing God has has proven himself time and time again to me is that He's trustworthy and he has more capacity to do than anything I could ever do. And so even as frustrating as it may be for us sometimes, it's an opportunity for us to learn to trust God and to allow him to work and to just rest in that, to know that God just calls us to plant a seed and he will use us as he sees fit for us to witness to those people that we cared about. And I'm not going to lie, it's hard. It's hard seeing your friends and your families reject, you know, Jesus and his truth despite all of your your tireless efforts. But just trust God that he will water the seed that he has called you to plant and, and rest in the in that faith, rest in that trust that he calls you to have in him. And again, the simple reality is, and it's not a truth that I like to think about or accept, especially when it comes to people that I love and care about. But by virtue of us being agents of free will, we have the capacity to choose the worst of the two options. And I pray that that is not the case for our loved ones and our friends. But God just calls us to trust him to do the work in that person. It's hard, but it's a, 
uh, a trusting process that he calls us to endure with him. Thank you, Brandon. Do we have any final comments before we hand back over to Rav? I just have a quick question. It's a bit unrelated, but Brandon, where are you from? What kind of sixth form are you talking about going for a swim after? I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm from Obey. I went to Cornell College. And if you know where Cornell College is, like you can literally just walk to the beach yeah, across the Cornwall. Okay, now it makes sense. I yeah. always wondered where you went to high school and like every week for the past year, two years, <laughs> I just forget <laughs> to ask. Okay, now it makes yeah. sense. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you guys for participating in Bible study. I'll hand back over to Rav now. <laughs> Hi again, guys. Thanks so much, Gabby, for leading us this week. Thank you so much. Like, I'm just, I'm still here kind of digesting some things and really just listening to you guys and taking bits and pieces from each of you. Yeah, I always love just listening, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know why. But, yeah. But thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for chipping in as well. Um, so, yeah, that was John chapter 3. Many highlights, many things you can get from this chapter. Um, and next week, we'll move on to chapter 4. So, you guys should prepare for that. Um, so, yeah. Now we're just gonna close out as we usually do with someone singing a prayer chorus and we're just gonna get our prayer list. I think today we can just, I think today we only need like one person to pray since it's just three um, prayer requests this week. So just need one person to volunteer to sing and another person to pray, please. Perhaps we can all sing together, since... <laughs> I, was, I was going to sing. Oh, okay. Take it to the office. Already going to sing. Alina, you want to close in prayer for us? Okay, sure. Hey. <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot, but yeah, I like hearing you, you pray. I feel like I haven't heard you in a while, so that's why. I don't know, something just tell me to ask you. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so whenever you guys are ready. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, shall be more than my way, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, I have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take. Every moment I'm awake, that have your way in me. Amen. God, have your way in us. God, as we come before you tonight, I ask that you transform each and every one of us, dear God. We're struggling in some way, some sin, whatever it is, dear God, respectively, dear God, of us in this group and those that didn't even come tonight. I ask that you just transform us, dear God, from this moment on, and just have your way with us, dear God. Dear God, give us the courage to, to walk that mission that you have set us on. God, help us not to be timid. 
help us to walk dear god in faith that you are going to strengthen us along that mission that you've called us to be in god i ask that you just bless julie i'm not sure what just specifically this is for dear god but school health mental health success whatever it is dear god just to walk in faith dear god with you i pray a special blessing over julie and matthew as well dear god just touch him dear god he's not here tonight not sure why dear god but wherever he is whatever he's doing dear god help him to feel your presence dear god and also shamoy as he flies off to school this is a big moment god you know the big moments of flying to a new country to do a new thing dear god and i ask that he feels your presence every step of the way along this journey and remembers to walk dear god in the steps that you order on dear god help him not to lose his way with the new pressures that come with a new environment the new pressures that come with school dear god help him to still focus on you and make sure that you're the number one priority dear god despite all the challenges dear god that will come Help him to call on you every time he's faced with a new challenge, dear God, and to use your direction to navigate through any challenge that may come his way, dear God. But we, we pray against any challenge, though, dear God, and that this will be a smooth transition in this new step of his life. And Brandon also has a friend that is resetting an exam, dear God. We know the pressures of school if you fail an exam. It don't feel good. So whoever this friend is, dear God, I ask that you give him the confidence, dear God, I ask that the studying that they're putting in there, God, I trust that they're putting in the work right now. Dear God, I ask that you just give them the confidence. Dear God, that you touch their brain, you touch their mind to remember what it is that they need to remember. And not only to remember, but to translate their God on the paper in the way that it needs to be translated, dear God, so that they can walk out to this exam feeling great, feeling and being successful, dear God, so they don't have to redo this again. Dear God, I trust, dear God, that you're going to lead them dear God, to do well this time around, dear God. Help them to trust you, dear God, as well with this moment and to learn from this experience, God. And Brandon also has a friend going through depression. Dear God, we pray against the spirit of depression, dear God, that is that is just over this generation. I don't know what is going on, dear God, but depression is rampant, dear God. And everybody in this group, this friend specifically as well, the wider Jamaica young people, dear God, we pray against depression. The enemy, dear God, is lying to this generation. They're lying to us and pushing us to sin sexually, overdosing, medication, drugs. Society is pushing it as well. The way I can just access cannabis if I want it to, dear God, it is not. Dear God, society is pushing and challenging your children, dear God, and I ask that you just strengthen us. Dear God, help us to flee from temptation, dear God. Help us not to identify with depression and anxiety, dear God, and to give, dear God. Dear God, you tell us not to be anxious, dear God, and to cast all anxieties on you, dear God. I ask, dear God, that you help this individual to not turn to worldly things such as drugs and medications, dear God, but to seek you, dear God, in, the, in that time of feeling low, dear God. You can deliver this individual from depression, dear God, and we trust you. With this moment, dear God, as they as they're in the hospital getting treatment, dear God, I ask that you just bring them back to full health, dear God. And then once they're at that point, dear God, to seek you and to feel your presence, dear God. Let this be a moment that brings them, dear God, to your feet, that they can surrender whatever issues it is, whatever mental challenges, dear God, that they're experiencing that had drove them, driven them to that moment, dear God. That now it can just drive them to you, dear God, fully to submit their lives to you. Dear God, so you can deliver them from this, dear God, that you can even allow this individual to inspire others, dear God, who are going through something similar, dear God. I ask that you place a special mission, dear God, on this person and transform them, dear God. And for Lamesh, dear God, is, is pray for deliverance over his brother struggling with a sin, to overcome a particular sin, whatever that sin is, dear God. We all have our past. We all have these specific sins, dear God, that we're dealing with as young people. I ask that you deliver this brother, dear God, in Christ. Just, just deliver them, dear God. Help them to feel your presence, dear God, and give them the steps, dear God. Equip them, dear God, with, with the tools, dear God. Whatever, when they open up their Bible, dear God, I ask that you reveal that word to them that's going to, 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 to lead them in the direction to overcome, dear God, and strengthen them to flee from the temptation of whatever sin that is, dear God. And Anonymous here is praying for healing and remolding from past sins. 
and that you transform their God, they're praying for transformation. And I think that's a prayer that all of us here have, dear God, that you transform us. Help us not, dear God, to soak into shame and because that doesn't come from you, dear God. Help us not to, to believe the devil's lies, dear God, that pushes us to flee from you or to feel ashamed to the point where we can't come to you, dear God. I ask, dear God, that as we falter, dear God, that you transform us, dear God, and you bring us back to your feet. Dear God, this person asking for healing and remolding, dear God, I ask that you shape them, dear God, and help them to walk, dear God, as a reflection of the child that you need them to be, to do their purpose, dear God, on this in this world, dear God, that you need them to do. I ask, dear God, that you do this for all of us, dear God. Those of us here that did not submit our prayer request, dear God, maybe we didn't have the time, or maybe we didn't feel like we should submit it, dear God, whatever it is that are on our respective hearts to pray for, dear God. You know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our lives. Dear God, I ask, dear God, that you just that you just move, dear God, in each and every one of us in whatever way that we need right now in this time, dear God. I also pray, dear God, for the city of Toronto, dear God. There's a storm. I got sent home early from class today, dear God, and I passed a few homeless people, and it broke my heart to see them curled up over the vents, dear God, not, not even proper winter coat and jacket and, and and i'm looking out my window right now seeing lightning and, and thunder dear god flashing i haven't seen lightning and thunder in years living in this city dear god and i'm looking outside my window right now and there's lightning and thunder flashing in front of me and and snow falling piling on my balcony and all i can think about dear god in this moment is the is the, are the individuals i passed dear god that are so underserved dear god i ask dear god that you give them shelter tonight that people, dear God, that are on the streets right now, that still have their businesses open, dear God, that have warm meals, dear God, still here, that they open up their doors to the people, dear God, on the streets, dear God, that are cold tonight. Dear God, this storm, dear God, they said it's going to go throughout the weekend, piles of snow. Dear God, I ask that you just soften the hearts of the people, dear God, in this city, dear God, to extend a helping arm to the people that are vulnerable, dear God, in this time. Let none of our brothers and sisters tonight, dear God, fall or suffer on the cold or hypothermia or anything like that, dear God, because people are selfish. Dear God, I ask that you just bring over a softened heart over the city tonight, that we can help out each other. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you, Yared. And thanks, everyone, for coming out again to another Bible study. Thanks again, Gabby, and thanks everyone yeah so this is the end of episode for this week i'll see you guys next week we've come prepared to do john chapter four and yeah so bye guys see you next week same time